Thank you very much for taking some time out for National Rock Review. Uh, I just wanted to say you have a wonderful studio, and I love the Godzilla statues. So, uh, me too. It's some of my favorite stuff in here. All right, so tell me, uh, I, uh, I heard that you guys have new projects coming out. What is the new project that uh, you personally have coming out? The new Sail Dweller album is called End of an Empire, um, and it's been in progress for a couple of years. Um, six songs, well, more than six songs, but six main songs towards the album have already been released. So I'm releasing this album, two songs at a time, plus a lot of bonus content. And then at the end, I kind of collect all of the full songs and then a few more songs that no one has ever heard, put them together on a CD, and there's the final release. I got, I, I think I, uh, you know, the internet has changed, the music industry has changed. I, I don't, and I don't really follow the trends, I don't really care about trends. I just do what works for me and what works for my fan base. And I decided a, a while ago, because I take a long time to make albums, there's no reason for me to go dark for two or three years making an album and then go, hey, here's the ten songs that you've been waiting for for a few years, when I could finish this song today and have it in their hands tomorrow if I really wanted to. So I decided that that, like years and years ago, my even my last full-length album, Wish Upon a Black Star, I did the same thing. I started releasing two songs plus a bunch of bonus content at a time. And so fans got music much more consistently and much more often than if I had just had them wait for a full album to be done. So, End of an Empire uh, is the new Cell Dollar album. It's already being released. The newest chapter, which is called Dreams, um, releases on March 14th, which is from today is only like a couple of weeks away. So, so End of an Empire itself, I decided I was going to do in four chapters before the final album comes out. And I named each empire, which are Time, Love, Dreams. And then the last chapter, I can't tell you because I won't announce that until just before it comes out. But there are four empires, time, love, and dreams, that people know about so far. Um, and there's a story behind them as well. They tie into the lyrics. I have a bunch of concept art. I've created alien worlds and planets and androids and, and, and aliens themselves. And they're having conversations on my tracks. You know, I've, I've kind of done a bunch of uh, my own voiceover. And then I get to have fun and play around with sound design and make voices and have, have them have conversations. Um, which hopefully paint pictures in people's minds of being on some alien planet and they can fill in the rest of the story that they don't know yet. So, With you not having a typical release, does that mean that trans, uh, that also goes into the writing process? Is it a traditional writing process or how, how does it work best for you to write these songs? Just to do them. I mean, I... I, I I mean, Cell Builder is just me. It's always been just me. Like, it's a one-man show. I, I do everything from top to bottom, recording it, writing it, performing it, all the instruments, using all this awesome gear to make really cool sounds, um, mixing it, mastering it. So part of the, the biggest part is just jumping in and writing, and, and, and I pull from whatever influence or whatever, insp whatever inspiration I'm feeling at the time, and that's kind of what comes out. I've never really wanted to overthink my music and go, this has to be this. Or my sound is exactly this. That's the one thing about Cell Dweller, Blue Stolly, the other artists on the fixed label, which is my label, is we are all multi-genre. You're not gonna, you're not. It's gonna be hard to find an, an artist on the fixed label that does heavy metal or does electronic music or does this style or that style. It's we're basically hybrid. We're just in our brains. I'm just kind of I've gone around and found the individuals, and some of them have found me around the world that under that that think the same way I do, that music doesn't need to be confined to a box or a genre. All kinds of music that you like, because most people, when you ask them what kind of music they like, what's the most common answer you get? Everything. That's usually what I get. Everything except country and rap. That's usually what I hear, and not always rap, but usually country. So, okay, if you like everything, if you like all kinds of styles of music, then why can't they all live in one universe? They can. It's always made sense to me, and that's been my philosophy on musical creation and what is the sound of cell dweller anything anything uh when did you start with the recent album uh from the time that you started until the time that you started releasing how long of a time span did it take from one to the other probably there was probably about a year in between when i wrote the first demos for what would be the new record to when i actually started releasing the first tracks um and now the, the other thing that you have to understand in my world 
is I own multiple businesses, all music related. Fixed is my label, which is also multifaceted. I have a clothing line. There's a lot of other things. So within a year, I'm not just sitting in here every single day making music. I wish I was, and I'm fighting for more and more time to be able to do that because I really mostly want to be creating music and not really doing meetings and you know those kinds of things. But right now, that's required of me. So. Um, Saying that I spent a year between the demos to the actual first part of the release, you know, that's probably uh, maybe four months, five months of actual production time. Maybe, maybe, I'm just guesstimating. So, there you go, for whatever it's worth. <laughs> okay, and how many albums total have you released? I don't have a clue. I, I have no idea. Uh, proper vocal albums like that are conceptual there are three main ones which are the self-titled cell dollar album wish upon a black star and now end of an empire but i have a series called soundtrack for the voices in my head which is all instrumental music that has gotten used a lot in film tv and video games most of my my regular albums have been too but that's specifically more for that um so i have three of those albums out right now i have a new series called transmissions which are all Sonic explorations using this gear here. Um, a lot of analog gear, a lot of external gear, not a lot of stuff in the box. I'm not just using a computer to make music. Um, live performance kind of stuff. Uh, I have sample packs, you know, producer packs that I uh, have produced sounds, and then I sell them to people that they can use in their own productions if they want. Um, and there's a lot of singles, there's a live album. Uh, I'm the worst person to ask about my own catalog because as soon as I'm done with that project, I don't even think about it anymore. So I'm sure there's more, but you could probably ask uh, my fan base because they are way more militant about keeping track of everything I've done. I have to ask, with all of the neat gadgets, is there anyone in here you're especially proud to have in the studio? Proud to have? Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm glad I have all these, but I'm really proud to have this Moog vocoder right there because that was originally made in 1979 by the Moog company and by, by Robert Moog and uh, um, a, a designer uh, named Bode who, who created the Bode frequency shifter and had done a bunch of design. So Bode and Moog got together and made this thing and there's a very limited number of these in the world. And a lot of the early albums that I used to listen to, like I remember Mr. Roboto by Styx. As a kid, hearing that, mystified by the sound of this robot that I'm hearing in this track. I'm like, how... Where is this thing? What does it look like? You know, and it wasn't until later on in my my life when I started producing music, I had a friend who's like, "Oh, that's a vocoder." I'm like, "What's a vocoder?" So for years, I've been using variations of vocoders and different things that will manipulate voices, but I only, uh, within the last three or four weeks, actually acquired one of these. And I could have bought a car for the amount of money I paid for it, um, but to me, that's more valuable to me to me than a car. So I would much rather have that thing, and I've already put it to use. Quite a bit. <laughs> Spoken like a true proud papa. So right. that's my baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, with the end of the empire, is there anything that a new fan that would come across your music for the first time, if they could take something away from it, is there something specific that you would like them to get from it, or is it more everybody's going to take something a little bit differently, and that's more than fine with you? That's kind of what I'm hoping for. I, I go out of my way to specifically not tell people what the lyrical content of my songs, what, what the meaning, or where they came from, because I feel like a lot of times that can ruin the experience for you. You might, re you might read into some lyrics that I wrote and they relate to a relationship you have, and maybe I wrote them about my dog. I, I don't know. I don't even have a dog, so that would be hard to do. But the point is that um, I, I strongly feel like the reason I make music is to exercise my own demons. To kind of, it's a cathartic thing for me to kind of get some, some information out. And I hope that people will pull from the songs what they want to, what they're hearing, what are they feeling. Let each person decide for themselves what that is. And I don't want to ever ruin that by imposing, like, oh, I hope you get this. And if you don't understand this, let me explain what this means, you know, because maybe it means something else to someone else. How hard is it to do the songs in a room like this and then convert them to a live show? Or have you gotten it to the point where it's almost seamless and the same experience, the same music you hear and hear creating it is the same that you could have in front of thousands of people at a, at a venue? 
Uh, I could, uh, but but because I get bored very easily, uh, I don't. So a lot of times my live shows sound a lot different than my albums because I look at the live show as a way for me to reinterpret my own songs and go, okay, for a live situation, this song is kind of like a slow ballady type track on the on the album. So how do I reinterpret that so that there's a little more excitement live or different instrumentation or people are going to recognize the melodies, they're going to know it's that song, but it's produced differently. I've never been a fan of... I'm not a huge fan of just live shows in general, and playing them or even going to view them. But um, I knew that when I was going to do a live show, I didn't want people coming there feeling like I pressed play on a CD and they're just listening to my album playback. In fact, the, the, the last tour that I did, which was the Live Upon a Black Star tour, which there's a full video, like Blu-ray, uh, and, and, and it's available on VOD as well, uh, a full tour it just it was just me and Brett from Blue Stolly who I invited along and he gracefully accepted so we put together this whole show and what it really was was an entirely remixed and reconceived version of a bunch of my uh, anything within my catalog up to that point whatever songs we felt fit um, we just kind of rethought them and we had two live guitars two live keyboards I did all live vocals um, my first instrument was drums so what I did is I had screens three screens behind us while we played and I, I filmed there was 75 it was a 75 minute show and there was 75 minutes of visual footage behind us during the show that was not only synchronized but all customized so it was all shot specifically for the show and so a lot of points where you're hearing the drums being played you're looking up in the screen and seeing me playing this kind of light up glowing kit um, and so you're seeing somebody actually playing the drums, although there's no not a live drummer on the stage. And then we would do performance pieces with live drums, fit you know head to head, doing these kind of performance pieces, all synchronized to the video up on the screen. There were times where we filmed filmed us playing some drums while we were also playing live drums on stage. So you basically have four dudes playing drums live, but there's really only two humans at that moment on stage, and everything else is being flown in from track from tracks, backing tracks. And to me, it was a much more, we got a lot of great feedback from it. Fans dug it because they didn't feel like they were coming to a regurgitated recreation of exactly what they heard on the, on the CD. It was, it was completely rethought um, and reconceived, and it was much more exciting for us to play it. So there's a part of you that it, you, you would never classify yourself as just a musician. You're also an entertainer. You're a grand sportsman almost with the, the added effects and everything else to make the fans see something they'll never forget anytime soon. I really hope so because when I, in entertainment, whether it be movies, live shows, anything of that sort, <clears throat> I am definitely looking for entertainment value like I want to be entertained I want to suspend my disbelief I want you to like give me something that I haven't seen so I I, uh, I would be embarrassed for myself if I were to just kind of cheat people out of their hard-earned money they're paying to see me play and all I'm doing is just kind of running through the motions I definitely want them to get an experience that they feel is unique and I'm excited about giving them you know so even right down to my albums, doing all this extra content with these voiceovers and creating concept art with aliens and robots and stuff. I'm trying to paint a picture and create a world that they can also exist in with me and kind of like, you know, envelop them in a little bit of a story based around the album instead of just going, hey, here's a song I wrote. It's just, it's a wider scope than just a piece of music. It seems like well, every musician has their artist that came before them to use as influences. Along with some of those for Cell Dweller, it sounds like you've also taken uh, certain influences from maybe B-movies or Godzilla movies or uh, things outside of music. Uh, what are some of those influences as well? Uh, Godzilla movies, yeah, of course. Um, really hard to say. I mean, you know, like um, uh, a lot of sci-fi. I'm, I'm, I'm a big science fiction guy, so I like horror um, I like suspense, I like thrillers, that's all cool, but really if, you get, if it came down to one genre, science fiction, and actually the science part of it is fascinating to me, the actual science behind it. Um, I love space, I love the idea of like, we are this tiny planet in this almost immeasurable sea of space, of just other planets and other stars. So those are the kind of concepts that infuse uh, my music and my creativity. So. Um, Digital art, like I'm, I'm a big fan of art. I have a Tumblr specifically where I follow artists that are posting things that I really like or that may inspire me. And those may create musical ideas in my head by seeing just a, a, someone's visual piece of art. Uh, so, yeah, for sure. Movies, you know, like Blade Runner is kind of one of my, my all-time favorites. I just, Brett and I actually are on the same page. He reminded me of a movie I haven't seen in 
a decade or more uh, called Strange Days um, with Ralph Fiennes. And it, it, I, I just loved the concept. It was written by James Cameron and directed by his wife at the time. Um, and I actually just watched that again last night and hadn't seen that movie in probably 10, 15 years. But it's a sci-fi thing and it's kind of like a heady concept about hijacking someone's experience by putting a neural net on their head and they see it so they record it and then you can you can buy that that disc and play it back and experience what they saw and what they were feeling and it's, it's just science fiction concepts concepts but it's possible that maybe in the future some of this stuff will be real so it's, that's the exciting part to me is kind of exploring that i have to ask for all the the inner geek star wars or star trek which Man, one that is such a hard that's a that's a that's a that's a tough Star Trek really, in my opinion, came first. It was kind of the, in, in my life at least, Star Trek was like, I remember my dad watching the original Kirk and, you know, Leonard Re Nimoy, re you know, rest in peace, but the original Spock and, you know, I grew up on that kind of stuff. And, um, but Star Wars was like, obviously, the first time I ever saw it, it just, it blew my mind. Like, it just changed my, my, my impression of the world as a kid, as it has for a lot of people. Um, ultimately, I think probably Star Wars... Um, hopefully Disney doesn't ruin it, as we're all hoping. <laughs> Please, guys, don't de don't destroy it. Please, J.J. Abrams. I mean, he did the reboot of the Star Trek, which I loved. I loved both of those movies really, the new, the, re the the movies that that he directed. And so him directing the new Star Wars Episode Seven. I mean, we all have high hopes that this is going to be equally as cool. So for all the Star Trek fans out there, and I'm sure this will get a nice discussion going on the way home. Who's better, Kirk? Or Picard. I was never a. Uh, I was never. A, I, I I phased out by the time Picard was in. So it's 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 Kirk for me. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, when with all the the different things that you have on your plate to handle, when you have a rare moment to yourself, a night off, what do you do to just decompress? What do you do to just kind of put this on hold and not go crazy? Well, as ridiculous as it sounds, this is this is what I do. So um, I, I haven't had a television feed since 2009. I canceled it. So I don't I don't even have cable. Um, I don't really know what's going on in the real world, and I don't particularly care because if it's that important, someone will tell me. I don't need to fill my head with just all the negative crap that's kind of peddled across the uh, the, the, the airwaves. So what I do is I rather I'd rather spend my time um, instead of. You know, I work all day on something that I have to do. I've got to get new cell builder material out, or I'm, I'm working on a new sample pack, or I've got to do meetings for this, or talk about my clothing company. So, when I when I'm like, I need to unwind, I can just go here, and I've got a clean palette, and I can just create some sounds that, just even just for the heck of it, and it sounds ridiculous, but it's actually cathartic. And then on the rare occasions where I'm even just too tired to do that, I will sometimes sit down and watch a TV show, or I think Bob Odenkirk is is great. Um, and I'm actually digging it so far. Um, so, you know, a few TV shows, pretty, pretty, pretty few, uh, occasionally. I've heard rumors that you might play a video game or two. Uh, what, what's your console of choice? Uh, <laughs> um, arcade, old school arcade ROMs. So Brett and I just did a, a Twitch stream, a live Twitch stream, because we have a 24-7 streaming, um, the fixed channel on Twitch is streaming 24-7 music, and so we hijacked that for an hour and a half, and he and I played Bad Dudes vs. Dragon Ninjas, which is an old arcade game. So the old arcade, uh, Donkey Kong, uh, Pac-Man, Ms. Pac-Man, Galaga, Missile Command, like those are the games that I dig. I have a PS3, and I've only ever used it to play DVDs, like when I would watch movies for years. I've, I've never played a single game in it. Um, I think I put Deus Ex in it once because a friend of mine sent it to me and was like, you got to check this out. I had somebody play it so I knew what was going on and then I never put it back in. And Dead Rising 2 because I, I wrote the theme song for it, so I got the game, popped it in, but that's pretty much as far as it got. Uh, okay, yeah, I kind of give you a heads up, so now we'll build up to the big question. A lot of bands have been out on tour. They could be out uh, in the in the scene for many, many years, many different interactions with different people. If there was one moment where you're sitting there uh, with any of the guys and you're talking about things that have happened to you, what's the one thing that regardless of when it gets brought up, how many times it gets brought up, it gets everybody laughing because it is your spinal tap moment? 
I've had, I'm sure, many in my career, but there is one, <clears throat> and Brett from Blue Stolly will give you the same exact answer because he was on the stage with me at the same exact time. It was literally just the two of us on stage. We were playing in Denver on a Tuesday night. The place was packed. It was, it was an awesome show. And because we use in-ears in the live show, there's no, there's no monitors on stage because I don't want feedback and I don't need them. So we hear the mix perfectly in our ears, including the backing tracks, what we're playing, all the key, all the synths, all the, uh, all the guitars. So the show sounds the same to us every night. So we go through the first song, which is called Through the Gates, where I start out on drums, Brett starts out on keys, and then halfway through the, the intro, I jump up to the keyboards, and we both kind of do this dueling keyboard thing, and there's this track, and it's this big epic thing. <laughs> and so we step out, we do this this intro, and we are rocking. We're just fist banging and head banging, and like, yeah, pointing at each other, like, yeah, you're awesome giving horns up to the crowd, playing, doing this whole thing. We finish the first four minutes of the show, the opening of the show, that four minutes, which is just to set the tone for everything that's to come. I step over to my tour manager to get my guitar for the next song, and he screams in my ear, there's no sound. And it turned out that somebody had turned down the mixer from the stage to the house. So all they heard was my live drums and nothing else. So we're up there miming and we're rocking back and forth and people are just hearing crickets. That's literally, there was nothing going on. There was nothing coming off the stage. They're seeing, synchro they're seeing video that's synchronized, but they don't know what it's synchronized to because they're not hearing anything. So I quickly looked down and said, yep, the mix was off. And I popped it up and instantly we had sound in the crowd. The crowd, fortunately for us, after the show we hung out, signed autographs, hung out with the people. And a lot of them were like, man, we really appreciate you guys like starting the whole thing with a comedy bit. It was great. And we were like, yeah, yeah, we started it with a comedy bit. It was, it was, that's what we do. We're a comedy act and a music group as well. And we are actually big fans of comedy, so it worked out pretty well. But man, it, it was, and it's a drag because I think it was pre-everybody owning an iPhone, so there was, no, we haven't found any footage of it anywhere online. We were hoping somebody filmed it so we can see just how ridiculous we looked, but it hasn't happened yet. How long ago was this? Uh, probably 2010. <laughs> so not that long ago. So would that be an instant humbling event on top of everything else? Just just to realize that as big and as, and as much effort as you pull into it, one little switch can make a huge difference. Thankfully, I try to keep my feet on the ground and try to stay humble because I realize that I am only human. Technology is going to fail. It does every single day in this studio, I can tell you that. Um, so, but it is, it, it, thankfully in those situations, it wasn't so disastrous that we couldn't actually laugh at it. We, we basically opted to laugh then take our guitars and smash them in a tantrum on the stage because that would have proved nothing except we were babies. So, uh, yeah, we laughed, and it, it is definitely, and it has become that, that conversation piece that we often bring up in social gatherings. Excellent. On a more serious note, just to kind of gauge how you see the interaction between yourself and the fans, if you heard a story of a fan being inspired to keep going through a hard time because of one of your songs or one of the Blue uh, Stolly songs, would that be more gratifying to you or actually getting some fan art or getting a story that uh, actually inspired you because of your fans? Or would it be a little combination of both that uh, as an artist you like to see people inspired by you and you can completely be inspired by that fan base at the same time? What what works best for you? I mean, how do you normally see that go down? Yeah, it's hard to say one over the other because I think at the end of the day, it's the most important that something that I'm doing actually affects them in a positive way. So whether it's one of my songs got somebody through a hard time or one of my songs inspired them to draw this picture, it's like because it came from that person and it was inspired by me, it's, it's humbling and flattering at the same time that that has made enough of a difference that you care enough to draw something and show me that you drew it or that you would send me a, an email on Facebook to say hey I was going through this hard time and this song really helped me through it or this album um, of course that's you know I don't think we're all put on this earth just to kind of take up space I mean hopefully uh, the majority of us are at least willing to help those people around us as much as we can um, and so that that that's it's rewarding to me when I feel like I'm doing something that actually makes a difference to somebody for sure 
with the modern social media platforms with everybody having the iPhones or the the smartphones how important is the social media to stay in touch with your fans one way or the other uh, with the sound clouds the reverb nations the Facebooks is that something that you utilize and you're actually happy that you can reach out with your fans in that way or is it something that you just have to take in stride because it's part and parcel of being a musician in this era well, I think I, you know, I can probably accredit a, a large portion of the fact that I have a career to, to social media because I don't think if I had the ability to reach out to the people who are actually listening to the music, some of the interactions and some of the, uh, the ability to, for that music to spread wouldn't have been in place. Um, so, I mean, I've adopted technology and social media from as far back as it existed because I was indie. There was no major label saying, hey, don't just sit back, just make music, we'll take care of it. I had to do everything myself, so um, places like mp3.com and then MySpace, when that was around, and you, you, know, you use those platforms to reach people um, and proliferate your music. They get to hear it in the player and everything else. And then I was a pretty insular, still am pretty much an insular person. I, I'm not a social guy. I don't like go hang out at parties. I, I, I just love doing this. These are my friends right here. This is cool. Um, so I would by naturally I would be more inclined to not even be a part of social media. But over the years, the interactions have been so cool. People are so cool, and the ability to actually talk to them directly. You go, hey, I'm working on this thing. Here's a quick little video clip of it. Check it out. Or hey, I went to go see this movie. What did you guys think? I think they appreciate it as much as I appreciate them responding. Okay. Um... Last one, and this is just kind of a neat question. Uh, with all the songs being used in various places, what would you think the most flattering or the most special use of one of your songs would be, or one of the the one that you kind of just think that's really cool that they used one of my songs? Would it be a movie, a video game, or is it just somebody taking one of your sample packs and using it? What what uh, what one sticks out in memory, if any, that you're just you just think it's a cool deal that they used it. Is there one? So some, something that happened or something that, that if it did happen, I would... Well, either or, really. I mean, you said that uh, Rising Dead 2 used your music for their soundtrack. Is there one thing that you were just like, wow, I, it, it's cool that they used it? Uh, yeah, if you're talking about something that actually has happened, yeah, Pacific Rim. Because, as you can tell, I'm a huge kaiju fan and a f huge robot fan. So... Uh, one of my songs was used in the trailer for a Pacific Rim trailer, and to me that was like, they, I would have just given it to him for free. I mean, it was like, I was so psyched when I actually saw this up on a big screen and hearing my track blaring while Kaiju are fighting Jaegers, I was like, this is awesome. That was, that was a big moment for me. The, the kid inside was pretty psyched. If there was one thing that you could get your music used on that would be uh, a bucket list item scratched off, what would that be? Star Wars Episode Seven. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you very much for giving us some of your time and some of your insights. And we'll try to only share it with a few hundred thousand of our closest friends. All right. Let's do that. Keep it on the down. Man.